And now, from approximately coast to coast, it's the Bob and Ray Public Radio Show. Well, you know, it's uh, about time for one of the fun weeks to take place. Now, which one is this? Well, we'll be observing National Peanut Week. And in connection with that event, reporter Wally Ballou is standing by near Jacksonville, Florida, to bring us a special report. So come in, please, Wally Ballou. This is the golden voice of Wally Ballou speaking from just south of Jacksonville, Florida. Beside me, pushing a peanut along the highway with his nose, is Mr. Pontius Whittier of the National Association of Peanut Roasters. Mr. Whittier, I assume this stunt you're engaged in is designed to get publicity for National Peanut Week? Well, that's right. Uh, Almost every time I push the peanut through, puts my picture in the paper, and I think it's a fine way. Hold it, uh, Mr. Whittier. The engineer just signaled me that uh, we're not picking up your voice very well. With your nose down there on the highway, I can't get the microphone close enough. I wonder if you'd mind standing for the interview. Well, it's... Stand uh, up, Mr. Whittier. It's a little early for my hourly rest period, but uh, I guess I could take it now. It's almost time for me to be changing noses anyway. Well, of course, that brings up the interesting fact that... uh, you're not actually pushing the peanut with your own nose. Well, that's, uh, that's quite correct. I wear a plastic nose over my own nose. Well, I see that it ties on there with a string that uh, goes around the back of the head. Yeah, and it ties, see, with a bow here in the back. See, the plastic nose has really been a wonderful development for long-distance peanut pushes such as myself. Now, it used to be that your nose would be all bruised and scratched up after 10 or 15 miles, but uh, now with this plastic device, I can push you 10 to 12 hours a day and still keep my real nose sound as a dollar. Well, you mentioned something about changing noses. Uh, do, you, do you have to do that at regular intervals? Well, yes, you see, the friction of the plastic rubbing against the concrete generates quite a bit of heat. And, uh, well, that causes the tip of the nose to wear thin. Now, a plastic nose has to be recapped or discarded after about 50 miles. So I assume from that knapsack full of noses there that uh, you just uh, throw the old ones away when they wear thin, huh? Yes, you see, the Peanut Roasters Association is sparing no expense on this project now. I started out from New York with a supply of about 100 noses, and I still have 65 or 70 of them left here. You mean you've pushed this peanut with your nose all the way from New York? Yeah, that's right. I left uh, Times Square at noon, June 15th. And if I hold a schedule, I'll pull up in front of the Los Angeles City Hall next Saturday to Climax National Peanut Week. It'll be the first coast-to-coast peanut push in history. (laughs) Just one thing, Mr. Whittier. If your route is from New York to Los Angeles, what are you doing down here in Florida? (laughs) Well, I'm just following route number one right here into L.A. Well, this highway doesn't go to Los Angeles. It just runs down the Florida coast and stops at Key West. Oh, I'm afraid you're mistaken. Here, I'll show you on the map. Uh, You see, route one goes right across here and... uh... Oh, gee. (laughs) That's... uh... That's 66 that goes to Los Angeles, isn't it? Yeah, seems to be, yes. Well, this is terrible. The mayor of L.A. was going to present me with the key to the city and everything. Well, thanks for talking with me anyway. You know, I had a hunch I should have turned right when I hit that last interchange on the New Jersey turnpike. Well, peanut roasters are going to be pretty mad about this. Well, we hope you have a nice trip wherever you're going. And now this is Wally Ballou near Jacksonville, Florida, sending it back to Bob and Ray in New York. Well, 
This is fun for us. It's the time we open up our telephones again and uh, present a feature called State Your Case, a portion where the listening public can phone in and give an opinion on some controversial issue of the day. Now, it's your big chance to speak out to the world on public affairs. So call in now. In New York, our number is Quincy 31277. And in today's Honor City, Washington, D.C., it's Bureaucrat 91184. <laughs> Of course, if you're planning to place a call in Washington, you should be aware that it's probably being recorded as evidence against you by the CIA, the FBI, the IRS. Well, excuse me, Ray, I think you're starting to speak out on a controversial issue yourself there, and only our listeners are supposed to do that, so maybe we might as well chat with the first one who's on the line. State your case. Would you begin by giving us your name, please? Yes, my name is Ethel Merman Strunk. (laughs) Well... If you folks wanted to name you after a famous person, wouldn't it have been more appropriate to pick a man? Well, when I was born, Mom and Dad only heard Ethel Merman sing on the radio, and they thought she was a man. Uh, I, uh... guess it's possible, especially if nobody rushed over to turn the volume down at times. Uh, What's on your mind otherwise? Well, otherwise, it's my opinion that we ought to make my wedding anniversary a national holiday... (laughs) Instead of the 4th of July. It's interesting. Why? Well, I figure that if public buildings were all closed and flags were out and people were shooting off skyrockets, it might remind me to buy my wife a present. <laughs> then uh, she wouldn't get mad at me every year. Do you have any idea when your anniversary really is? Yes, it's December 25th. <laughs> but uh, when that time comes, uh, nothing ever reminds me to buy my wife a present. <laughs> You know, I'd suggest you watch the newspapers for the first announcement of the January white sales. Think about it, and we'll take a call on the other phone. Could I have your name, please? I'm Moxie Livernoy, and I'm calling from a phone booth at Epcot Center because I thought I was standing in line for something else. (laughs) Financially, you're better off this way. uh, what's, What's your opinion? I think being a high school dropout is a great advantage to a person in later life. Why is that? I don't know. (laughs) See, I'm too uneducated to figure out the reason. Well, I think you've just presented a convincing argument against yourself without realizing it, and I hope our other listeners will feel free to do the same next time when you'll all have another chance to speak out on State Your Case. And now we return again to Garish Summit and its endless story of intrigue among the socially prominent. There in stately splendor, far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As action begins, Rodney Murchfield is back in his office after trying without success to collect ransom by faking his own kidnapping. (laughs) Suddenly, the door opens. Rodney's somewhat younger brother, Caldwell, enters. Caldwell speaks. I just want to get my personal items out of the drawer of your presidential desk, Rodney. I kind of moved in while you were kidnapped, figuring the crooks would never send you back alive. That type of cold conniving is so like you, Caldwell. Thank you. I consider myself a keen student of human nature. And knowing how I'd strangle you if I ever got my hands around your slimy throat, I assume the kidnappers would do the same. Uh, Is this my toothbrush behind the paper clips or yours? Well, probably mine. My overbite makes the bristles get fuzzy that way. Okay, you know, I still can't understand why the crooks didn't rub you out. In fact, you don't even look like a guy who's been kidnapped. Your hair's neatly trimmed. You've got a new manicure. Well, I can't discuss it except to say that the kidnapper is a student at a beautician school who (laughs) chose to do his homework on me. That sounds pretty fishy to me. I wonder what the cops will think when they start checking out this loony story of yours. I just have some routine questions, Miss Agatha. Some of Rodney's account of the kidnapping strikes us as a bit unusual. Frankly, Sergeant, his story strikes me as downright loony. Well, we use the term unusual in the same general sense. Well, I should think so. My word, 
Who ever heard of a kidnap victim gaining 10 pounds while he was away? <laughs> Rodney claimed they tortured him by making him eat chocolate eclairs. Yes, that was a questionable point. And then, too, he wasn't just dumped out on a roadside. He said the crooks gave him $50 to rent a car and drive home. One with air conditioning and cruise control, I believe. Rodney said he demanded air conditioning and cruise control. Well, you know, criminals don't usually pay much attention to demands like that from their victims. Well, I imagine that would be especially true in Rodney's case. He's so spineless when it comes to standing his ground against blue-collar types. Well, I hate to say it, Miss Agatha, but this whole kidnapping sounds like a fraud to me. And if anybody else was in on the conspiracy, that person may be trying to get out of town right now. Uh, give me a one-way ticket to, uh... What does that say up there for the next bus, Detroit? No, that's Duluth. The next Detroit bus isn't until 9.15. All right, I'll go to Duluth. That's better than going at 9.15. You sure seem to be in a hurry to get out of town, mister. Yeah, what's it to you, kid? Well, as chance would have it, I'm no ordinary 12-year-old. I'm Spanky Merchfield, the son of Caldwell Merchfield that he never knew he had. <laughs> and who was abandoned in infancy by a previous marriage. Oh, yeah? By whose previous marriage? My mom and dad's, which brings me to the reason for striking up this conversation. You see, if anything happened to both Rodney and Caldwell, I'd be the legal heir to the Merchfield billions. Good for you. Now move aside. I got to catch a bus to Detroit. Duluth, the Detroit bus is not until 9.15. Well, I don't care. I just want to leave town. I assumed that from the beginning. I may be small and homely, but everybody knows I'm a good judge of character. That's why I've decided to hire you to kidnap both Rodney and Caldwell Merchfield, only this time, do it right. Will Rodney's kidnapper agree to kidnap him for a second time in the mistaken belief that he can't be tried twice for the same crime? <laughs> Will Spanky be turned over to juvenile authorities because he hasn't been tried for the crime even once? And what about the lengthy treatment required to cure Rodney's overbite? Perhaps we'll learn more next time when we hear the bus driver say... Sorry, pal, this ticket's for Duluth. I'm going to Dayton. That's next week when we resume our endless story of intrigue on Gary Summit. Say, now we've come to music time here on the old Bob and Ray show. And for your afternoon listening pleasure, we swing out to the skyline room of the Frimla Hotel in Evansville, Indiana, for the haunting melodies of Lloyd Fletch and his all male orchestra. Yes, indeed, indeed. This is Buddy Blodgett speaking to you directly from the picturesque skyline room of the historic old Frimler Hotel, high atop downtown Evansville, where the elite meet to rhapsodize with Lloyd Fletch and his all-male orchestra. Right now, I'm moving toward the bandstand with our Bob and Ray microphone to have a few words with the maestro himself. Lloyd, welcome to Big Time Radio. Well, thanks very much, buddy. And on behalf of all the men in my all-male orchestra, let me issue a hearty welcome to the picturesque skyline room of the historic old Frimla Hotel overlooking all of Evansville. <laughs> and uh, even some of the farmlands beyond, right, Lloyd? That's right, buddy. We're up on the 12th floor here. Yep. So, of course, that gives the patrons of the picturesque skyline room a panoramic view of all of Evansville and even of some of the farmlands beyond. Right. We certainly invite your listeners from throughout the area to join us here for late afternoon dancing every weekday, but not Saturday or Sunday, because those aren't weekdays. Oh, very true. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very true, Lloyd. Incidentally, as you were issuing that invitation to music lovers throughout greater Evansville, I was uh, noticing that you don't have much of a crowd here today in the picturesque sky room of the historic old Frimler Hotel. I only count five people out there at the tables around the dance floor. You think that's because this is a weekday when most people are working, or what? 
No, I think it's mostly because the historic old Frumla Hotel has been condemned and boarded up, buddy. <laughs> the skyline room up here on the 12th floor is the only section that's still occupied. Mm -hmm. And to get here, music lovers have to climb over those fire department barricades down there in the lobby. And then they have to walk upstairs because the elevators are no longer running. Yeah, well, I notice even walking upstairs is kind of hazardous because some of the steps have almost crumbled away down there. Well, I think that's to be expected, buddy. You see, the Fremler was closed as a fire trap back in 1974. <laughs> so the owners uh, don't have much incentive to keep it in good repair now that it's abandoned, see? Even though the picturesque skyline room is still open, huh? Well, I don't think the owners of the building know it's still open, buddy. Uh, we don't advertise the place. So the only patronage we get is through word of mouth. Sure. Uh, you know, like today, as you mentioned, we have five customers, and I imagine they're all hobos who sleep on the abandoned floors down below. Uh-huh. See, they hear music coming from up here and just stop by to see what's going on. <laughs> well, isn't it a little hard for you and your all-male orchestra to make ends meet with that type of clientele, Lloyd? Well, we're certainly not getting rich, buddy, but... Uh... <laughs> Of course, uh, whatever we take in here at the picturesque Skyline Room is all profit. We don't have to pay rent or buy a cabaret license because nobody knows we're here. Sure. So I just split the receipts with the guys in my all-male orchestra, and we do okay. All right. Under those circumstances, I can see how you might. Incidentally, a question popped into mind as you were speaking then. Could you tell our listeners why your group is billed as Lloyd Fletch and his all-male orchestra? Well, primarily, it's because we don't have any women in it, buddy. <laughs> But uh, originally, we had a better reason than that. Well, it sounds like a pretty good reason to me. What, uh, what could have been the reason? That... Well, uh, years ago, the group uh, was just called Lloyd Fletch and his orchestra. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was in the era when all the big bands were out on the road. And we kept getting booked into the same towns as Phil Spitalny and his all-girl orchestra. So we started calling ourselves the all-male orchestra to let people know they had a choice. I... <laughs> suppose that helped your business, huh? Uh, no, it pretty well ruined us, buddy. <laughs> See, when people have a choice of seeing an all-girl orchestra or an all-male orchestra, <laughs> they'll take the girls uh, nine times out of ten. So that's how we wound up in the picturesque skyline room of the historical Fremla Hotel. Uh, we couldn't get booking anyplace else. Well, you know, that's the very type of sex discrimination we're all fighting against these days, boy. <laughs> And while we think about the injustice that's been done to you and your group, I wonder if you do me a real personal favor and give us one of those patented Lloyd Fletch renditions. Sure thing, uh, buddy. Now, that's a catchy tune that a lot of the bums and winos who hang around in the Skyline Room ask us to play quite often. It's called uh, <laughs> Melancholy Baby. Well, that's a, that's a terrific selection, Lloyd. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, Melancholy Baby in the patented style of Lloyd Fletch and his all-male orchestra. I see that our time is about up and rough. the picturesque skyline room of the historic old Frimler Hotel overlooking downtown Evansville, Indiana. This is Buddy Blodgett bidding you a bit of a fond farewell and returning you to our New York studio. And hey there, boys and girls. It's time for the Charlie Chipmunk Club to come to water. And here to read another exciting Charlie Chipmunk story is your old friend, Uncle Edgar. Well, thank you, Bob, and hello, boys and girls. For today's story, I want you all to turn to page 22 of this month's issue of the Charlie Chipmunk Club magazine. And there at the top... I certainly hope you boys and girls haven't forgotten to send in your subscription order for the Charlie Chipmunk Club magazine. Twelve big issues delivered to your home for only $18.95. <laughs> Uncle Edgar. Thank you. Now, there in the first panel, kids, we see that it's lunchtime at the tiny school for the little forest creatures. And Charlie Chipmunk is telling all his friends about the trip he's going to make 
to visit his grandmother Chipmunk in the city. And be sure to notice, boys and girls, that all the little creatures have brought their lunches to school in genuine Charlie Chipmunk lunch boxes. They're made of handsome thin gauge steel, and each comes with its own Charlie Chipmunk thermos bottle. Only sixteen ninety eight at better drug and variety stores. Now back to Uncle Edgar. Okay, well now in the next panel, we see that Charlie Chipmunk is at home packing his suitcase for that trip to Grandmother Chipmunk's. And of course that's an official Charlie Chipmunk suitcase, gang. Strong vinyl two-suiter in authentic chipmunk brown. <laughs> With black stripes and the price a remarkably low sixty nine fifty. Okay, Uncle Edgar. Look, uh, hey, uh, Bob, I kind of wish you'd stop uh, horning in this way, you know. Uh, we're never going to get the story finished unless you clam up. Well, it's all those wonderful commercial sponsors that keep us on the air, Uncle Edgar, and I think you and the boys and girls should bear that in mind. Okay. All right, well, now we're up to the third panel, kids, and we can... Uh, See that it's raining hard as Charlie Chipmunk sets out on his journey. See those big puddles and Charlie with his raincoat and umbrella? It's authentic Charlie Chipmunk foul weather gear, gang. A heavy-duty slicker, umbrella, and galoshes, all with the official Charlie Chipmunk emblem and all for seventy two fifty. <laughs> Tell Mommy to get yours today. Hey, look, uh, I'm not going to uh, hold still for this now. We're only supposed to have a commercial at the beginning and at the end. Now, I don't think federal regulations even allow as much advertising as you're throwing in here, really. Well, I like to call this public service announcements rather than commercials, Uncle Edgar. If you just stop calling attention to them, everything would be fine. But I'm only up to the fourth panel in the story. Well, don't complain so much. I'm surprised you've gotten that far. Go ahead. Okay, I'll try. Well, now, boys and girls, we can see Charlie Chipmunk holding his little suitcase as he waits on the corner for the bus to come and take him to Grandmother Chipmunk's. And, of course, we all know what kind of bus he's waiting for, gang. It's a genuine Charlie Chipmunk double-decker. Plenty of room inside for you and 71 of your little friends. <laughs> Diesel-powered and air-conditioned, yet it costs a surprisingly low 52500 <laughs> And best of all, your local Charlie Chipmunk dealer will arrange easy payment terms to fit your daddy's pocketbook. And hurrying right along here, boys and girls, we now see Charlie Chipmunk arriving in the big city. And there's Grandmother Chipmunk. Well, I'm sorry, it... Uncle Edgar, but it looks as if our time is about up for today. You know, I knew this would happen. <laughs> I've never finished a story on this show yet, and I want you to know that somebody in authority is going to hear about it. Join us for lots more fun at the next meeting of the Charlie Chipmunk Club, boys and girls. First, I plan to tell the station manager all about you, and if he won't do anything, then I'm going straight to the Federal Communications Commission. Say goodbye to the boys and girls, Uncle Edgar. Goodbye. And that puts the lid on things for this get-together today, the Bob and Ray Public Radio Show. Produced for the Radio Foundation by Larry Josephson, who often wears a sweater, but has never been mistaken for Dan Rather. In the Department of Associate Producers, ours is Marjorie Van Halderen, who believes no one is writing new fortunes for fortune cookies anymore. And Technical Paul, director is Malcolm Addy. And Paul Taubman, a man who can name all of the seven dwarfs, except one. He provided the music. Sound effects expert, as usual, is Al Schaefer. Engineering by Joe Lopes and Mike Getlin. Production assistants, Diana Freed and Stuart Zagnett. Funding for the Bob and Ray Public Radio Show is by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Through NPR's Satellite Program Development Fund. Well, now, this is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. For a free picture of Bob and Ray, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000, GPO, New York 10116. That's Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000, GPO, New York 10116. Thank you very much. Thank you. This program was independently produced by the Radio Foundation. And now, from approximately coast to coast, it's the Bob and Ray Public Radio Program. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It is just that. Yeah, it's the Bob and Ray public radio program. (laughs) I'm Bob. And look, I'll be Ray then, huh? All right, okay. (laughs) Now, we have uh, many new features, some of the old. And, of course, our Bob and Ray family, Webley Webster, Wally Ballou, Mary McGoon. Why don't we introduce uh, some of them right now? Webb, you're standing by the closest. Webley Webster. How do you do? It's a pleasure to be here, I'm sure. (laughs) You can save your applause until they've all come forward here. (laughs) Mary McGoon. Yes. Fine. Wally Ballou. Yes. Hello, everybody. Well, it's uh, really going to be wonderful. And it's going to be beamed by a satellite, I'm told. What does that, uh, what's <laughs> I, that mean? I don't know how, how it's going to get here, Webb, but it will somehow. And here's more great news. With us today are Bob and Ray financial advisor, Dr. Rex Latchford. To answer your questions about investment, Doctor, I'm afraid we can only allow a few minutes for this feature because we didn't know you were planning to come by today. Well, that's a direct result of my latest money-saving idea. I didn't call ahead because I had the phone taken out of my office. <laughs> now, I expect to save at least $25 a month that way. Well, guess that'll add up over the years if you can operate your office without a phone. But isn't it true? You told us last time that you used the title doctor because you're a veterinarian? Uh, that's right. However, I don't need a phone because my business is all mail order, see? Uh-huh. I sell uh, good luck charms that light up in the dark and other novelties like that. Seems like an unusual sideline for a veterinarian. Well, I'm not exactly a practicing veterinarian. I, I dropped out of school a few semesters uh, before I got my degree, see? Well, how can you use the title doctor at all, then? Well, I don't know. It just gets started some way, and people <laughs> pick it up. I mean, kind of like a nickname, yeah, you mean? Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, doc, you know. Doc. Yeah, like a nickname. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're here, even though we weren't expecting you. And I can see our phones are lighting up already with calls from... <laughs> Listeners seeking your advice on how to invest their life savings, so why don't you just take over? Well, uh, fine. I always enjoy talking to people who have extra money they don't uh, know what to do with. (laughs) Hello. You're on the air with Dr. Rex Latchford. Hello. Uh, I've recently made a large profit selling tickets in the California State Lottery, and I'm looking for some place to invest it. All right. Incidentally, I didn't know that California had a legalized state lottery now. It doesn't. (laughs) That's how I've been able to make such a large profit selling tickets in it. I see. Well, now that I've had the opportunity to learn more about your business and its objectives, I think you might make a good client for my underwater salvage program. It's a... It's an ideal tax shelter. Maybe. How does it work? Well, you send me a check for five thousand dollars, and if you don't hear from me again, the loss is tax deductible. <laughs> oh, I, I don't mean that part. I figured that's how it worked. I mean, how does underwater salvage work? I don't want to get caught in some fly-by-night deal, you know. Oh, uh, this procedure is well established. A diver will be sent down into the waters off the Florida coast to recover gold from a sunken Spanish galleon. We know it's there. You mean a guy wearing a diving outfit will do this? Well, the investment prospectus uh, doesn't mention what he plans to wear, but (laughs) this is a multi-million dollar project, so I'm sure they won't just buy him a ready-made suit off the rack. Okay, I want to make sure this is all going to be done first class. I'll get my check in the mail to you tonight. Fine, now uh, we'll move along to our next caller. Hello? You're on the air with Dr. Rex Latchford. Hi, I'm Big Ed Furnose of Appleton, Wisconsin. I recently retired from my job at the overall factory up in Oshkosh. (laughs) So now uh, you're seeking a way to invest your savings for maximum income, is that it? No, I lost all my savings uh, several years ago when the Sheboygan and Milwaukee Outskirts Railroad went bankrupt, so I haven't got a dime. That's my problem. Well, I think uh, you've diagnosed it right. (laughs) That's definitely your problem, so... uh, We'll move on now for one final quick call. (laughs) Hello, you're on the air with Dr. Rex Latchford. Hello, I'm calling long distance from Laramie, Wyoming. Well, I'm sorry, but it's the other Rex Latchford who used to live in Laramie. Gee, you sure came back with that remark awful fast. Well, I just wanted to make that point clear. I guess you've gotten calls like this before since the other Rex Latchford also worked that scam about hunting for Spanish gold. No, this is the first I've ever heard of anything like that. However, we seem to be running out of time I think I'll here. start the paperwork to have you extradited to Wyoming just in case you turn out to be the same guy. Well, suit yourself. And now, friends, until my next broadcast, which may come to you from either Costa Rica or Brazil... This is Dr. Rex Lashford wishing you all good day and good investing. (laughs) 
Now that moment you've all been waiting for has arrived when we again play a portion of our secret Bob and Ray mystery tune. Now this is your big chance to win a whole array of valuable prizes. That's right. No one could correctly identify the mystery tune last week, so that means our giant jackpot has now risen to $15. And is just waiting here for some lucky listener to collect. Well, that big cash prize is only the beginning, friends. A number of businessmen here in our neighborhood have also donated some really wonderful merchandise gifts. So if you're the first to correctly identify our mystery tune, we'll be sending you a giant jar of chunky-style peanut butter, a dozen legal-sized file folders, a full pound of ten-penny nails, and a coupon good for five dollars worth of free dry cleaning. Now, those are good prizes. Now, of course, that dry cleaning prize will be especially nice if the winner happens to live nearby. It's also useful for any out-of-town contestant who may wish to mail his dirty clothes to New York together with just $3 for return postage and handling. And speaking of -of out-of-town contestants, let me say that you're eligible to phone in with your guests on our mystery tune from anywhere in the United States. However, we don't have a toll-free number, and again this week we won't be accepting uh, collect calls. Right, but uh, that's only part of the big news. In addition, those who phone in long distance while we're taking another call may be put on hold for as long as 15 minutes. And thereby experience the thrill of running up a truly impressive charge. In fact, it could become a long distance charge you'll want to tell your children and grandchildren about for years to come. So stand by and see if you can identify this mystery tune. Okay, that's it. That's the clue. That's it. And our phone is still silent. It's, uh, it's amazing to me that no one in the entire country well, can name that song. Ray, we really didn't give them much time to call in. To be well, it's uh, not the type of thing a person uh, would have to mull over. You either know it or you don't. Well, well, wait a minute. I think I hear the phone now. Apparently, we uh, have a listener who thinks that he or she knows it. <laughs> or maybe I'm just hearing bells. I don't know. There it is. It is. Let's find out. Hello. 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 Is this the special Bob and Ray mystery tune phone number which you neglected to mention over the air? <laughs> and I just had to guess that? Yes, it is, sir. <laughs> and I assume you think that you can give me the correct title of the song we just played, right? Did you hear my bell okay? <laughs> yes. Uh, I certainly ought to be able to. You see, I wrote that song. Oh, really? Yeah, it's entitled, My Love Waits for Me in Dubuque. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry, that's not correct, sir. What do you mean? I'm telling you I wrote it. It was 1949, or no. maybe it was 1948. Well, the year doesn't make any difference, because... Wait, well, just, just let me straighten you out here. See, I was putting on a, a college vaudeville show out at Oklahoma State right. with a guy named Wingy Kleinfelder. All right. And uh, he wrote this tune, and he asked me to put some words to it, so I did. No, that very evening. Well, that's an interesting story, but we have the true story well, and the true me, title. But there's uh, one thing I could uh, add here for complete accuracy. The school was still called Oklahoma A and M in those days, mm-hmm. but now it's Oklahoma State. To be completely accurate. <laughs> I wish you'd been that accurate in identifying the tune, but you weren't. You no, definitely no, I didn't. got Unless it wrong. It goes like this. <clears throat> Oh, my love waits for me in the butte. Oh, that's the one he just played, isn't it? Well, that's close to the tune, but those aren't the words. Well, I don't think Wingy Kleinfelder would have given uh, that same melody to anybody else afterward. <laughs> he never told me if he did. Well, sir, the original song was written several years before yours, and the record label doesn't mention a Wingy Kleinfelder, I can tell you. Are you saying that Wingy stole that melody? And I wasted my talents writing words to do it for nothing. I can't believe this. Well, I didn't want to come right out with it, but that does seem to be what happened, yes. Gee, I don't know what to say. It was, uh, he was like a brother to me. Uh-huh. And he deceived me. <laughs> well, I guess you'll have to put the experience behind you now. Well, that's not easy to do. I spent 30 years of my life trying to get that song recorded, and nobody would touch it. Now I know why. Yeah, I guess it would explain that part for you anyway. If I ever get my hands on Wingy, he's going to pay for this. Oh, well, fine, because we're certainly not going to pay for it <laughs> out of our contest jackpot. But next time, some lucky listener may win it all when we'll once again conduct our big Bob and Ray Mystery Tune contest.
Now join us as we return again to Garish Summit and its endless story of intrigue among the socially prominent. There in stately splendor, far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As our drama resumes, wealthy Agatha Murchfield is in jail following her unexpected arrest on charges of stock fraud. Suddenly, her hopes rise when she sees family attorney Bowden Pardue enter the cell block. Agatha reaches frantically through the bars and calls out, I'm down here on the end, Bowden, just beyond the drunk tank. <laughs> I'll be along shortly, Agatha. I'm renewing a friendship here with an old law school chum. He tells me he's in the pokey for teaching his wife a thing or two with a meat cleaver. Well, I'm sure it must be a fascinating story, but I'm the one who pays you the retainer, so move it over here. Uh, very well, Agatha. I'm on my way. Well, I must say uh, you took your time about showing up, Bowden. I've been in the clink for almost 12 hours even though my bail is less than what I spent on a week's supply of floor wax at the mansion. Well, I apologize for the delay, Agatha. I received your message last night just as I was leaving to take an important client to dinner at Howard Johnson's. <laughs> I'm sure you can understand. No, I really don't understand at all, Bowden. In fact, I'm not even sure why I'm here. The police claim I broke the law by spreading rumors that the Merchfield lead mine had started producing silver by mistake. Now, what's wrong with telling a little anecdote like that? Well, I can think of only two things wrong with it, Agatha. First, the story wasn't true. And second, it enabled you to make a $4 billion profit when the stock of Merchfield lead doubled overnight. Well, I don't know why it's a crime to get a little bit lucky in the market. Besides, I didn't make up that story about discovering silver at the mine. I originally heard it from you. Oh, now, now, Agatha, you mustn't try to grope around in desperation for some feeble alibi. Anyway, your devoted son Rodney is straightening out the whole misunderstanding with the police right now. I'm sure the statement he's giving will clear you completely. Okay, Mr. Merchfield, run it by me just once more. You say your mother has never been a con artist who caused thousands of small investors to lose their life savings. Is that it? Well, I don't believe I'd care to go on the record as saying she's never been a con artist and <laughs> did things like that. I'm just certain that she's been law-abiding all this month. Okay. Well, your word's good enough for me. After all, uh, you'd have a lot to gain by becoming board chairman of Merchfield Lead if your old lady went to prison. So here, just sign a statement and I'll turn her loose. Come to think of it, I'd hate to risk putting a dangerous criminal back on the streets. <laughs> Perhaps I'd better have the servants look through Mother's private papers to make sure her activities have all been perfectly legal. I want to be very, very sure about that. Hey, Wilfred, how come you've got Miss Agatha's private papers scattered all over the room like that? Uh, what are you taking out? I'm not taking anything out, Lloyd. I'm putting in these false documents at Mr. Rodney's request. Wow, this is powerful-looking stuff. The Agatha Merchfield plan for swindling thousands of small investors out of their life savings. A thousand and one good places for wanted criminals to hide. Does anybody else know these documents are just phonies? Of course not. Master Rodney shared his secret with me alone, and he's paying a tidy sum to make certain my lips remain sealed. Wilfred! I thought I told you to put all those phony documents away. I just finished dusting in here. Don't be concerned, Lucille. Once I've completed my devious mission, there won't be so much as a fingerprint of mine left in this room. Well, see that there isn't. I don't want your shady nonsense making double work for me. Mr. Rodney is a clever chap, Lloyd. That's why I'm delighted to have his assurance that this fake document scheme is foolproof. It makes me certain that we'll be happily rid of Miss Agatha... For a long time to come. Will the judge notice that Rodney's evidence against Agatha is all in his own handwriting? <laughs> Will romance bloom once Agatha becomes acquainted with her next door neighbor in the drunk tank? And what about Lloyd the gardener leaving muddy footprints on the library rug? A 
But perhaps we'll learn more next time when we hear Bowden Pardew's old chum from law school say, I'm telling you, the missus just backed into my meat cleaver and got a splitting headache. <laughs> That's next week when we resume our endless story of intrigue on Gary Summit. Friends, do you realize that Valentine's Day is just around the corner? And once again, you'll probably be caught at the last minute trying to think of an appropriate gift for the one who's nearest and dearest to your heart. Well, this year, it doesn't have to be that way, thanks to the new line of special Valentine's Day gift flypaper being offered by the Einbinder people. Now, each strip is beautifully decorated with bright red hearts and cupids. It will be admired by your loved one all winter and help to keep flies off him or her all next summer. For a Valentine remembrance that's useful as well as decorative, you couldn't ask for more. But for that perfect gift, you must insist on Einbinder flypaper, the brand you've gradually grown to trust over the course of three generations. And welcome again now to the Bob and Ray Public Service feature, Chatting with Dr. Chesney. Now, this is the portion of the show where we invite all of you disturbed listeners to call in and receive some expert advice from the noted psychologist, Dr. Merton Chesney. Say, doctor, it's good of you to take time from your private practice to be with us today. I'm interested in your comment that it's good of me to be here. You know, our concepts of good and bad are just personal attitudes that our parents have taught us. Well, in a general sense, I suppose so. However, I was... Uh... No, there's no doubt about it. So the only question is why your folks taught you that it's good for a psychologist to leave his practice in order to appear on a radio program. Well, I don't think that specific issue ever came up when I was a child. <laughs> now, you see what happens? We forget how we were taught our moral standards, but we still accept them as fact. Now, close your eyes and search into your subconscious. You're a two-year-old in your playpen. No, that's you're... not what I am at all. Now, if you'd uh, be good enough to pick up your phone there, and let's get on with this well, thing. Why do you imply that it's good to pick up a phone and bad I not to? I don't know. Just pick it up. <laughs> I can see the subject is upsetting you, so I'll let it go for now. Pick up the phone. Hello, you're on the air with Dr. Chesney. Hello? My name is Stanley W. Proxwelder. Well, and, uh, sir, we don't want you to give your full name on the air. We'll have to cut uh, that out Okay, later. well, then uh, let's just say I'm a, an anonymous parent. All right. And I'm having discipline problems with my son, Stanley W. Proxwelder, Jr. Uh, how old is the boy? Oh, I guess he's about eight. Uh, maybe still five. <laughs> hey, kid, how old are you? Your relationship with your son must not be very close if you have he to He says ask. he's 12, but I don't know. He's a, he's a pathological liar. Well, that's your chief problem, then, I guess. He tells lies, right? No, that doesn't bother me much. I hardly ever talk to him. Uh, the main problem is uh, how he keeps doing these annoying things just because he knows they bother me. Well, give know? me an example, could you? Oh, sure, lots of them. For instance, he always brings home a perfect report card. And I'm sure he does that just because he knows I flunked everything when I was his age. So he likes to give me the needle, you know? And I suppose you've tried keeping him home from school as punishment. Yeah, but then he just tries to set the house on fire. That's what I see where a lot of light, though. See, I'm a professional arsonist. Well, then I'd suggest you and your son build a relationship by pursuing your mutual interests together. Now I have to turn to another caller here. Uh, hello, you're on the air with Dr. Chesney. Hello. I'm not sure what my problem is, but I know I'm terribly angry. Well, we mustn't think of anger as being an abnormal condition. It's often an appropriate response, ma'am. Well, it's certainly appropriate in this case. Ever since your man was out here, I get gas from my water faucet and cold water from the stove. And he charged me $30 just to mess up the pipe. Uh, now, you uh, have the wrong number, madam. I'm... <laughs> I'm Dr. Merton Chesney, the noted psychologist. And the, uh, well, then, your man's even put my telephone on the fridge. Now I'm really ticked off. Well, as I said, that may be an appropriate response. We have time for just one more call, I'm told. All right, you're on the air with Dr. Chesney. Make it fast, please. Uh, hello? I just heard you tell the first guy not to give his name, and I was awfully glad about that. Is that because you want to preserve your anonymity, too? No, it's because... 
because I don't remember who I am. Well, uh, then you're suffering from amnesia. Have you uh, had a blow on the head recently? Well, how would I remember something like that when I don't even know who I am? Well, if you had an accident, there might be some evidence around that would help you prove it. Well, that, that's true. Uh, hey, Evelyn, have you noticed whether any of my dirty clothes are torn like I'd been in an accident? No, she says not. Who was that you were just talking to? My wife. <laughs> Why can't she tell you who you are? Hey, I'll bet maybe she could at that. <laughs> Gee, I don't know how to thank you, Doc. No, thanks are necessary. Just knowing I've helped you is enough. And on that note, this is Dr. Merton Chesney wishing you all in Radio Land good luck and good emotional stability. Well, once again, we must wend our way out of Studio B and bid farewell to the Bob and Ray Public Radio Show. And remember, there are more of them coming your way soon on this station. They're produced for the Radio Foundation by Larry Josephson, who likes a surprise as well as the next guy. Marjorie Van Halderen did a fine job as associate producer. As did the Heifetz of the Hammond, our musical director, Paul Taubman. Thanks to Al Schaefer sounding off and to our production assistant, Stuart Zagnett, for doing his thing. Engineering was by Mike Moran and Joe Lopes. Funding in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the NPR Satellite Program Development Fund. And now this is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumb. For a free picture of Bob and Ray, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000, GPO, New York 10116. That's Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000, GPO, New York 10116. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. This program was independently produced by the Radio Foundation.